now, you, you tell me when you turn on Joe. And you've been on seven since you came in. All right, well, welcome back to the uh, second annual IBM Ring 122 Silent Mora video night. This is November 26, 1985, for future reference. Uh, for, and, and my name is Dave Downs. I'm president of Ring 122. Um, I'm now introducing the amazing Anthony. He's president of Assembly 104 up in Salem, Massachusetts. Let's give Anthony a nice big hand. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Just want to tell you a couple of stories. Uh, uh, you know, there's two kinds of fishermen. There's those that fish for sports, and uh, there are those that catch something. Well, I'm one of those guys that catches something, and I want to show you what I caught here. It's a fish. He's about this long. You know, this isn't really the fish that I caught, but he, he looks something like this. Well, uh, maybe he wasn't quite that long. Let me just... Uh, yeah. Yeah, he was about that long. In any event, uh, I remember one day, uh, the day after the fishing season opened, I'm walking through the woods and this old man came up to me and he says, do you mind if I walk alongside of you for a while? And I said, no, that's fine. <coughs> and he says to me, he says, did you catch anything? And I says, no, I said, the fishing here was terrible today. I says, but yesterday, before the season opened, they were literally jumping right out of the water. As a matter of fact, I probably caught about 15 bass. He looked at me and he says, he says, young man, I know he was a nice guy as soon as he said young man because nobody's called me that in a long time. He says, young man, he says, do you know who I am? He says, no, who are you? He says, I'm the game board. I says, oh, is that so? He says, yeah. He says, I says, do you know who I am? He says, no. He says, I'm the biggest liar in the world. <laughs> and as a matter of fact, speaking of lies, the fish really wasn't that big. It was... Uh, there's more about that side. On the way home, uh, I stopped off at a fish market. I said to the guy behind the counter, I said, Would you throw me a couple of fish? And he looked at me and he says, Throw you a couple of fish? I said, Yeah. I said, I want to tell my wife that I caught them. I'm not much of a fisherman, you know, but I'm no liar. Of course, you know, there's a lot of guys that don't catch anything until they get home. <laughs> you know, he really wasn't that big either. Look. Yeah, he's about that size. I found this beautiful fishing hole one day, though. I was sitting there, you know, and I'm pulling that fish out of the water one after another. I had about six bass uh, sitting right beside me. Along comes the game board, and he says to me, he says, you can't catch anything here without a permit. I said, I'm doing pretty good with a worm. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think the fish really was that big either. <laughs> getting there. You know, uh, you know what fishing is really all about, don't you? It's uh, a jerk at one end of the line, waiting for the jerk at the other end. <laughs> Not much of a fish, is it? As a matter of fact, you know, I know it's not much of a fish because I'll tell you. By taking a snip off the tail, throw it away, I know it's not much of a fish because you see I ate the fish. <laughs> <laughs> Passing of a solid object through another 
using a can of Coca-Cola.
Uh, we're getting a little while to set up. <laughs> is Jack Ryan, president of Boston Assembly Number no. Nine? Let's give Jack a nice big hand. All set to go. The Hound of the Baskervilles by Sir Arthur Conan Doyle. This is one of my favorite books of all the stories that Conan Doyle printed. I have a whole collection of these. This was put up by Collier and Son. If you're familiar with the story, it uh, starts with the curse of the basketballs and goes all the way down to the uh, death on the moor. An interesting thing about this, Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, as most of you know, was inter in, uh, interested in spiritualism and things of the mind. In fact, a lot of these things came out in his stories. Would you hold this a minute, Anthony, please? Okay, thank you. Uh, and the first story that came out when Holmes and Watson got together, he brought out the fact that Watson said to Holmes, he says, you know, Holmes, you're so knowledgeable in a lot of things when it comes to science, biology, criminology, you're brilliant. You almost have total recall. But when it comes to other subjects, for instance, uh, geography, sports, politics, world affairs, you know absolutely nothing. And Holmes said, well, the way I figure it is, your mind is like an attic. The more stuff you put in there, the clutter it gets, the less you're able to find things when you want them. So to keep my mind bright, I just think of the things I want to. So in retrospect, what I'd like to say is that Conan Doyle felt that when we're at peace and calm in our mind, we can come up with the best things. Now, for instance, now, Anthony, you got the book there, right? Right. Okay. Now, Ray, I know you're a suspicious person. <laughs> just relax your mind. If I gave you the choice of top or bottom, now keep your mind on the subject at hand. If I gave you a subject <laughs> top or bottom, which would you choose? Top. The top. Okay? Top You're a top <laughs> man. Okay. <laughs> Mary, I know you're a very suspicious person. You're back there looking at the Mary, if you had a choice of left or right, which would you choose? Right. The right. So we have the top on the right. Anthony, you may stand right up here or so everybody can see you. I'm going to give you my card, and would you stick it anywhere in the book, please? I know you're a very, very suspicious person. So would you open up to that page, please? The page you cut to. Now, Ray, top, and we have the... Right. On the right. Would you look at the top line on the right-hand side of the page? In fact, just for the heck of it, look at the left-hand side of the page. Would you read the top line on the left-hand side? Yes, I was telling Sir Henry that it was rather late. Okay, so we didn't pick that, we picked the other side. Now look at the top line. Okay. All right, I want you to unclutter your mind and think of what it says. Let's see if I can get a picture of it. He's talking about meeting somebody in London, somebody that's, uh, that's thin, <coughs> excuse me, and somebody that's very... Dressed very handsome like Gordon Barry. Would you uh, would you read that top line? Whom I have seen in England, slim, elegant, and tall. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> Two decks of cards. We'll have a choice here. Sir, would you come up? I've never met you before, so uh, I know everybody's a magician here. You probably have too. What is your name? Uh, Malloy. Mike Malloy. Mike Malloy. Would you have a choice of either deck? Red or blue? What would you like to use? Blue. Blue deck, okay. Would you put the red here for now? Now, Mike, I'm going to put the cards down. Oh, let's put it this way. There's a small crowd here. If we were doing a show, the cards are all different, correct? Yeah. Okay. Would you like to cut the deck? Yeah. Okay. Now, Mike, I'm going to put the cards down one at a time, and I want you to stop me whenever you want, whenever you feel like it. Okay, did you want this card down? That's fine, okay. Mike, I'm going to take this top card and just put it right there for the second. If you had stopped me on this card here before, you would have got the four of hearts. The next card I thought you wanted maybe was the two of spades or the six of hearts, or one of these others, but you didn't. You stopped me on that particular card, all right? Now, Mike, would you look at that card, please? All right? You got, no, don't show it to anybody yet. All right, put it in your pocket. Do you know what it is from the blue deck? Would you open the red deck, please? Yeah, take the cards out. And I'd like you to turn them over, face over. And I want you to count down the cards one at a time. 
When you see that card in that deck, I want you to stop. Okay. <coughs> Remember what that card is yeah. from the blue deck? Yeah. Okay, go ahead. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, eighteen, nineteen, twenty. 24, 25, 26, 27, 28, 29, 30, 31, 32, 33, 34, 36, 37, 38, 39, 40, 41, 42, 43, 44, 45, 46, 47, 49. It's not in there, is it? No. It's not in there. Not there. Not there. I missed a count. This is 51. All right, Mike. Uh, would you look at your card now? Because this is a big trick, and I have your card here on the other side of this. Believe it or not. Your card is here. <coughs> what is the name of your card? Two of Clubs. The Two of Clubs. And ladies and gentlemen, we have your card. <laughs> uh, I'm only kidding, Mike. I'm only kidding. Are you sure? No, hold it up so everybody can see it. Right. Inside we have your card, the Two of Clubs. Correct? Yeah, oh, I'm sorry. The Two of Clubs. Is it there? <laughs> it's there. All right. Thank you very, very much. came here tonight, I took a card out of the blue deck, and Alan, okay, would you stand up, please? I gave you an envelope? Yes, he did. Okay. Would you open the envelope, please? And would you take out the card that's missing from the deck, and would you show it to everybody? What is it? It's the two, two, of, two of clubs that we had. That's it, short and sweet. Thank you very, very much. Thank you. Thank you. Our next performer is Bob Brandt. He's president of Assembly 26 down in Providence. Up until now, you've seen some fine magic. Our next performer will change all that. <laughs> Rhode Island's round bag magician, Bob Brandt. Let's give him a nice big hand. I love you too, David. <laughs> Good evening, everybody. My name is Bob Brandt. For those of you that don't know me, I am a magician. Uh, perhaps you've seen me at the movies. No? I go quite often. <laughs> what I'd like to do is uh, offer you a, a few things. Uh, David asked me a while ago to write some uh, articles for the Silent Messenger, and I'd like to show you something tonight that's going to be coming out this month, or well, next month, I believe, and uh, I hope that you'll find it interesting. What I'd like to do, first of all, though, is uh, I'm going to need the assistance of a young lady, and I only happen to see two Mary. Could you give me a hand with this, Mary? Yay, Mary! This is Mary. Have we ever met before? No. Yeah, that's too bad. I would have liked to have met you before. <laughs> <laughs> that's your husband over there? Yeah. Okay, we don't have to play with him. We'll just play this way. <laughs> Mary, what I'd like you to do for me, if you would, do you have any ring that you could remove from your finger that we might be able to borrow? I'd like to show you something interesting. Wow. Oh, wow. This is very pretty. It's uh, got a place for five stones here. <laughs> a whole bunch of little holes there for diamonds. <laughs> See. Do you know the worth of this man? Do you have any idea what this is worth? You don't have to tell us what it is. I don't want everyone to know how cheap your husband is. <laughs> Do you have any idea how much this is worth? Vague. Vague idea. Oh, let's see here. Oh, an inscription. I'm sorry. To Mary on that wonderful night so many years ago. Let's try and do it again next year. Uh, love. J.C. Panay. Oh, that's interesting. That's a very, this is a very nice friend. Well, would you just hold it at your fingertips so everybody could see it for just a second? Because I ran across something this summer which I found extremely interesting. And most people don't know the value of the jewelry. Most people depend on a, upon a jeweler to tell them. You go in with a pocket full of money, he puts a little thing in his eye and he says, uh-huh, you would like that, give me all your money. And most people fall into that kind of a rut, which is unfortunate. But I found a way to check the value of jewelry during the summer. And magicians have always been a little bit predisposed to dabble into alchemy, trying to turn base metals into precious. 
And this is one of the things that I found was very interesting. Uh, what we're going to do, first of all, we'll use this little bit of paper, and I'm going to make a little fist here. And Mary, just so everyone can see, oh, you've seen this before. No. Oh, oh that's okay. You put it right there, right there in the center. Because what we're going to do is we're going to wrap your ring in a little bit of this paper right here, just like this. Now, what I want you to do for me, I'm going to get it just right because we don't want anybody to refer to it. What I'd like you to do for me is to, uh, let's see, we'll take a, I have a little clip here, and hold on to your ring by the clip. Okay? Now hold it up in the air. Uh, Mary, don't hold it in front of your face, first of all. One of the lessons in show business is never hold anything in front of your face before the show. After the show, when you're running out, you might have to hide. <laughs> but never before. Just hold it up in the air, just like that. And now, Tillery, I don't want you to get hurt when this happens, okay? Now, I know, you seem a little bit, oh, it hurt. Don't worry about this at all. I've done this once. I didn't get hurt at all. No problem. Uh, the girl ended up in a hospital with second degree burns, but don't worry about a thing. Actually, what we're going to do is we're going to check for the value of your ring. And the way to do that is to wrap it in some of this, it looks like litmus paper. I don't know if you're familiar with litmus paper. But what you do is you wrap the ring or the article in litmus paper and hold it up, and then you run a flame underneath. Now, if the ring is of good quality, nothing will happen to it. If it's of poor quality, then it will begin to tarnish a little bit. Okay, is your arm getting tired? Yeah. Good. Hold it up a little higher. <laughs> now, all we have to do is light the flame like this, and hold it underneath, and don't worry about a thing, because, oh, oh, ha, ha. you didn't get hurt, did you? No. Oh, great. <laughs> Neither did I. <laughs> oh, boy, that did give me a start, though. Gee, I, <laughs> it does appear, though, Mary, that, uh, <laughs> uh, I guess that wasn't a very good quality. <laughs> I'll tell you what, do you have another one? Maybe we can try that again. <laughs> no, you don't like that idea too much. Well, I knew I see I was coming into virgin territory here. A lot of virgins out there? <laughs> no, actually, I came uh, fully prepared in case something should go wrong. I've had this happen to me once before, where we seem to have lost the ring. Um, before we even got started, I have a, a box that I placed on the file cabinet next to your husband. As a matter of fact, right in back of where you were sitting. Can you see it from here? Mm -hmm. uh, what's your husband's name? Yeah. Ed, would you do me a favor? Ed, wake up. <laughs> oh, hi, Ed. <laughs> right behind you, Ed, there's a box. Uh -huh. Oh, you've seen it already. So Could you just... Hours ago. Ed, we didn't ask you to come up. <laughs> I don't mind you, Ed, I don't mind when you stand up, but when you come out, I get nervous. You can go back and have a seat there, Ed. I knew I bought her a sparkler, but I didn't think it would be. <laughs> Actually, Ed has just brought us this nice jewelry box. I stole it out of my bedroom today just for this occasion. What I'm going to do, this is my insurance policy. Okay? I'm going to give whatever's inside of this box to you. Now, the box has been sitting there since I got here earlier in the evening, and it has something nice inside of it in place of that chintzy ring that uh, Ed bought you. <laughs> that had all those places for stones. So if you'll just go ahead and just tear open all of that wrapping that's on there. Ed, be an animal, Mary, Ed. Don't be embarrassed because they care. That's the way to do it. Just like on Christmas. I'll take the, give me the wrappings and I'll take the wrappings. Give it a good tug. It's only cheap double back tape. Inside, I'm gonna let you have this. Oh, look at that. But wait, before you take it off, let's just show everybody because Actually, they don't get a very good view of this from where they sit. I've got a beautiful rose for Mary. As a matter of fact, Mary, I'm going to let you have this rose. It is such a, it's such a nice... Huh. Oh, geez. I there's something on the end there. Would you like the rose? Yeah. Sure. Here, you can hold on to that. And there is a little package here, Mary, on the end of, of the rose. And believe it or not, there's something inside of it. If we can just hold it like this so that you can see, and tear open the tissue, you'll notice that huh. having a difficult time. 
inside of this little package, Mary, there is a ring. It has a nice place for five stones and a whole bunch of little diamonds, just like this. As a matter of fact, it does have a very nice inscription on the inside. I won't bore you with it. <laughs> this does seem to be yours. Is this not your ring? Right. Yes, it's not. <laughs> I knew I did. This is your ring. Mary, thank you very much. Which finger does it go on? Oh, I haven't done this in so long. <laughs> oh, our nervous. There you go. Thank you. And thank you very much for helping us out. Thank you. Yeah, I thought I had a couple extra gallstones. <laughs> David asked me to keep it down to 10 minutes of my best material, and I don't think I could come up with 10 minutes of my best material. <laughs> so I keep it impromptu, and it has been as much as possible. I have one thing I'd like to show you. It's a variation of something that you've seen millions of times, and I hope that you enjoy it. handing their secrets down from magician to magician, generation to generation, from culture to culture. One of the most famous is the Chinese linking ring. Someone to come up here and uh, help me with the uh, first little stunt. 
and it involves some money, and I'd like to have somebody that hasn't seen me before, because I'm going to hope that I can possibly uh, fool you with it. Is well, it Mike? I haven't been, I haven't been Mike, you haven't, haven't seen me before, before. and I'm just hoping that maybe uh, I can fool you with this. Lord knows whether I cannot. Mike, I'm going to pour some money into your hand. And before I do, I'd like you to look and see my hands pass your inspection. And you're going to take the money in your hand, and you're going to count. It involves a little glass, and how much money have you got over there? Well, you've got to count it all up and see. I'm supposed to use a little card with this. I don't have a playing card, but this card. Yes, that's 83 cents. I believe that is correct. All right. If I can just take the half a dollar from you, please. All right, I'm going to take the half a dollar. Can you see that my hand is absolutely empty? Yeah. Right. You know where the 50 cent piece is. Would you give me any of the three of those coins, please? It's up to you. Any three of them. You want three? Okay. Oh, okay. Don't take your eyes off the money in my hand for a minute, Mike. Because I am now going to put in the money over here with the half dollar. You know how much money is in my hand now because you've given me the, how much money is over there? How much money is that? 62 cents possibly. You won't take your eyes off the money for a minute, will you? Because it may vanish if you do. Don't, don't blink for a minute. I'll take the other three. The other three. And I'm going to ask you to watch carefully now. And I do really put the money right up here in the hand. You know where all the money is? Can you see you're close enough? I know where it all is. Right here. When I go like that, get like that, that's when it happens. Did you see it happen? I oh, thought the there. In the hand. You won't, you won't pay, you won't, you won't be fooling. The half a dollar's over there. You don't take your eyes off the, the money for a second, will you please? When you just look for a second, it really did vanish. I will let all you right. buy that 50 cent piece for 50 cents. There's the glass, there's the cart, and that's the end of it. assure you that this is ordinary newspaper with nothing hiding in it. But you probably won't believe me. You're suspicious of everything, I'm sure. I'm going to do the trick with either this piece of paper or this piece of paper or this piece of paper and I'll discard the other. Anthony, you're up close. Is there one of these pieces of paper that you'd say, we'll do it with that one instead of the other one? It's up to you. I don't I don't want to have it in my choice. Do you it do? with that one. Do it with this piece of paper. So these have nothing hiding. You're probably close enough to see, Anthony, that there's nothing hiding in both of these sheets of paper. But just in case I, I wasn't being very honest with you, uh, which one of these would you prefer that I do the, the stunt with? That one. Do it with this one here. On the left here. I'll put this over here. Okay. I'm going to tear this in two. I hope you're close enough to see. Nothing hiding here. Nothing hiding here. <laughs> Anthony, don't pick the wrong one out. Pick the right one. Which piece of... Left hand. Do it with this one here. That one there. No chance I can do it with that one there. No, I want you to do it. This one here. Hand. Look, if I do this, if I just roll it in a little ball like this and poke a hole into the paper like this, you might think for a moment that you see something unusual coming out of there. It looks for just a second as if you see something bright coming out of the paper. Can you see what that is? It's a brightly colored handkerchief. But besides the brightly colored handkerchief, there's two. And some of these fellows who think they know the tricks, I don't think two could fit into whatever it is that they're thinking about. <laughs> <laughs> Anthony, which of these handkerchiefs shall I use? The yellow one or the blue one? The yellow one. Can you see the red silk handkerchief hiding in the center of the yellow one? That's a yes or no question. No. Can you see it any more clearly over here on this side? No. Al, you're not part of the act. Just show the audience one finger, will you please? Take that finger, just push a little hole right down in it. Can you see the red handkerchief output in there? No. I don't know how many of you believe in magic, I don't know how many of you care, but look. When I go like that, for just a second it seems as though a new one has been born, right where Al poked a little hole down there. Isn't that amazing? Now would you like to know how that got there? Well, you see what I had done is I had pushed it down into a little bunch. And if you push it down into a little bunch, it doesn't show so well. In fact, if you squeeze it down to it's about the size of a BB, then sometimes you can almost make people think that it's going to vanish just by going like this. It just seems to blend in so well that they hardly notice it. Yeah. <laughs> people had said to me, well, what if he wanted this paper over here? Now, you see, really, if he had wanted this paper over here, I could show you 
that even though it appears to be ordinary, if I just take an empty, ordinary finger and poke a little hole right there, that sometimes you could think for just a second that you saw another handkerchief be born in the center of the paper. Now the people in the back say, oh God, I missed it, he did so fast. Look, what I did was I poked a little hole right here. And when I poked the hole, it just seems as though a second handkerchief gets born in the center of the paper. I'm going to throw this paper out here in just a second and let you examine it. And you see, really, it's an ordinary sheet of newspaper that has nothing hiding in it except these handkerchiefs, and you can examine the paper. Now, I'd like to have someone else come up. You can hardly be a magician, folks, if you don't do a card trick. And I'm hoping you're going to see one here that you haven't seen before, but I have done it for the club members before, so hopefully there may be some other people here. It may resemble... It may try that map, so you that map. It's got quite a story, Ray. It has quite a history. This will resemble a little bit of a trick you saw before, but this is different. Uh, you saw this here at a lecture a couple of years ago, and outside of that, I hope you've never seen it any place, but it's, it's got a history. Uh, who, now let's see, Joel, you've never seen me do this, have you? No. Come on up, Joel, and help, would you please? Now, we haven't prearranged anything, have we? No. Okay. Uh, if you can guess what's in this bag, you can win a hundred bucks. Money? Uh, is that the uh, $100 money or that's, is that so you guess what's in there? If you can guess correctly what's inside that bag, you can win $100. Money. You, you missed. That's all right, most people do. Look, inside this bag, Joel, there are two decks of cards. A blue deck and a red deck and a dark. It will probably look <coughs> like an ordinary dark to you. But in just a moment, I'm going to tell you the story of that dark. Before I do, Joel, I want you to have a free choice and pick either the red deck or the blue deck, it's your choice. Blue. You sure? Yeah. All right. In just a minute, I'm going to take you, uh, well, you can take the blue, the deck out, the, take the cards out of the blue deck, show everybody there's 52 different cards to put in. Meanwhile, I'm going to take the other deck, Joel, put it in the bag, watch this, I'm going to open the lid, without looking at random, I'm going to take one card out of here, without knowing what it is, turn it upside down, put it back in the deck, close the lid, okay? One card in the red deck has been reversed. For safekeeping, would you hold that? One card is reversed. Are there 52 different cards there? Yeah. Roughly. Joel, you may now spread the cards around face down, face up, or half face up, half face down. That's entirely up to you. I don't care. But would you make a big target area out here so they're all showing? Just spread them all around in a hurry. If you want to put them face down, it's up to you. It doesn't make a bit of difference. Spread as many so that they're all showing. You can just spread it. it you don't have to count them out. I mean, there, there will be 50. It's just a, a full deck of cards. And, Spread them around any place you want. Ladies and gentlemen, I have a very electronic device here, or else you're going to believe in magic. <laughs> this dart was built in England for $13,000. It's now going to go over and optic scan the deck over here and take a view of the one card that's upside down on that deck. You don't quite believe it, do you? When I twist the feather like this, it is now on seek. It will now go, having <laughs> optic scanned the card that's upside down, it will now go over here and seek that card. If I were to throw it, you'd say, well, he knew what he was doing. If I let Joel throw it, and the dart went and found that card, would you be impressed? Would you think the dart, or would you think it's magic? Expensive. Believe me, it's magic. It's not. <laughs> Stand up. Here. Joel, 52 cards spread around. Are they all different? Yeah. Did you show people? Look, folks, there aren't any duplicates here. You've spread the cards the way you want. We haven't prearranged any. No. The card, no. The dart knows the card that's upside down. Joel, be fair now. Without hurting anyone in the front row, please. Are you a dart player? Uh, a little bit. Okay. Don't tell anyone if it misses the card that you were throwing at. Throw the dart and tell us what card. <laughs> Just whip it. It got a card. Yep. You want to let the audience see it? Sure. Fair enough? I don't know if you folks could believe that a, a, an electronic device like this could work. If you don't believe it, you're probably going to have to believe in magic. It hit the four of diamonds. My hands are empty. You've been holding the deck? Ladies and gentlemen, I don't know whether you're going to believe this or not. But over here, one deck of cards. Nothing else in there? Nothing else. No? <laughs> Look, uh, you're not going to believe this. Look, one card in here is upside down. I don't know where it is or what it is, but we're going to see if there's one card upside down here. I don't want to touch it, please. Would you pull it out? Show the audience what it is. I hope we got lucky. What did we hit? Four diamonds. Oh, okay. 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 Well, that's just for the fun of it.
of it. I'll uh, put these away. I'm going to uh, break up the magic here and tell you a little bit of a story, just because I like to keep them laughing. The amazing, amusing. I hope that was the, amu the amazing part. This is the amusing part. You know, a long time ago when I decided to get into magic, I figured, boy, I could really make some money in magic. And I thought if I go out and get all the shows I want a year from now, I ought to be able to buy that house for my family, you know? Business wasn't quite so good, so about halfway through the year I decided, well, what the heck? If I could settle with a house like that, I could probably afford the taxes better in the landscape and so on. But you want to know something? The way my act's been selling lately, I think I'm going to end up with this house there, and I don't want to live in that house. <laughs> well, that's just for last. That's got nothing to do with it. Uh, I'll take time out now and come out to the audience and have people help me, but let me put this deck away for a minute. And then I'll show you two more things. We got time for three tricks? Sure. Oh, good. Good, good, good. Incidentally, any of you people that would like to see me on the Johnny Carson show, Friday night, January 15th, at 12 o'clock, write in and tell Johnny, will you please? <laughs> <laughs> Now, let's see. I've uh, done this trick for many, many years. The last fellow I did this for was the Pope. Well, I think he was the Pope. He said he was the Pope. Would you finish that now? He didn't actually say he was the Pope. What he said was, Gordini, if you're a magician, I'm the Pope. <laughs> <laughs> now, one rope has been tied into a knot. And I'm going to make you think that I took the second rope and put it through the first one. I'm going to start to tie a knot here. Would you be so good as to finish that knot? I don't do this for a living, folks. I really have enough money saved up to last me for the rest of my life. Just so long as I don't live past supper time Friday night. I'm going to take a third one and put it through the center of the other one. Al, you're close by. Maybe you would finish that knot for me. Would you please? Thank you. Appreciate it. Three ropes have been tied by three people. And they are really and truly linked together. I think you can see that they're all real. And I don't know if you want to believe in magic or not, but if you do or don't, don't go home and try this, because you can try this for a long time. And I guarantee you, when you go home and try this, you're going to spend a long time, and you're going to get absolutely no place, because this is magic. I'm going to do two more things for you, and then I'm going to be done. Uh, I'll save this one for last, but uh, before I do, I have a trick that's probably my favorite trick, and I'd like to have uh, the assistance of someone who has never seen me come up and help me with this one. It's going to remind you of a trick that you saw before, but quite possibly this is my very favorite trick. And um, I don't think either Leo or Al have seen this. So, uh, would one of, uh, one of you guys a card man? Either of you fellows like cards, Leo or Al? Would one of you two come up here? But I want you to assure the group that uh, we haven't prearranged anything. Which one, uh, Leo? Good, appreciate it. Uh, if you just stand there, Leo, I'll have you help me with this in just a second. Um, we didn't arrange a thing. It's very similar to the trick that they were doing a few minutes ago, but it's different. And I'm going to let you do the trick. There are 52 different cards, and you're going to do the whole thing. I'm going to explain to you exactly. But uh, let me tell you, it has always bothered me why, at the factory, they take a full-size deck of cards and put it in a little miniature box. I have no idea why they do a thing like that. That is so... You, know, you don't know how many nights I've stayed awake worrying about that. That really does bother me. 52 different cards. I'm going to give you the deck of cards. And I'm going to ask you in just a minute. Let me explain to you what I want. I'm going to give you a chance to win some money. It's not a very good chance, but it's a chance. In my wallet, wait just a minute, I have a $20 bill. <laughs> this is a lot of money to me, so I have to keep you safe. Now I'm going to go. Is that a real $20 bill? Yes, it is. It is. And in this envelope, there is one card. You don't know what it is. It's not from that deck, but it matches one card in that deck. Would you please run your fingers over the envelope three times? Now let me assure you, the magic of that card is getting on your fingers. It's going to run up your arm into your brain, and it will force you to stop in that deck at the card that you just dealt to. You don't know what card's in there. No. Look, I'm going to put it back in my wallet here, right next to the $20 bill. I'm going to let you hold my wallet under your arm if you will. 
You're holding my wallet with my $20 bill and one card in an envelope, which is a prediction. It's a prediction of what card you will stop at as you go through this deck. I'm going to give Leo the deck of cards. Instead of me doing the trick, he's going to do it. The cards are in his hand. The choice is up to him. All I ask you to do is discard cards one at a time and just stop at random. Don't look for a certain card. Don't count to a certain number. Just say, ah, I'll stop now. The now part's up to you. Now, let me explain to you. If you stop at the card that's in the envelope, you don't win any money. But if you stop at any other card, you own the $20 bill. Does it sound fair to you? It sounds very good. Let me explain to you. I am a jip, a fraud, a cheat, and a swindler, but this is only a trick, and it is my $20 bill. So I hope you stop at the card that I think you're going to. The magic got onto his fingers. It's going up your arm. It's going to your brain. I am confident you will stop at the card in the envelope. One at a time, would you please discard cards on my hand and stop it? You can turn them face up so everybody can see that, you know. Turn them face up. Stop any time you feel like it. Doesn't matter. And we'll stop at that one. You're sure? Positive. Positive. Look, I didn't uh, control you in any fashion. You could have stopped at any of these. Had you gone one further, you would have stopped here. Is that true? All right. right. You're holding one card in your hand. You want to let everybody see it? My hands are empty. For the first time, may I have the wallet? I don't know whether you want to believe this or not. Look. Do you want to uh, see one little card? Look. If this card, you understand, if this is the sixth time, do you understand that you don't win anybody? Is there anything hiding in the envelope? Not right. Now, I want to take this a step further. You could not quite believe that uh, if he loses the $20, I get to keep it. In my jacket here, reach in the pocket, is there one card, one giant, look over here, there's no giant cards in there. Reach in there. Any giant cards in there? Reaching that card. Is there one card or is there more than one card? <coughs> more than one card. Pull it out. Pull whatever's in there. Twenty card. Just one card? It really is just one card. One. I got lucky. David, they look okay? Nothing. Fasten your seatbelts, ladies and gentlemen. This is a big ball. Can you see it? It's bright. And it's red. And you cannot hide something this big and this bright between your fingers. You just can't do it. Is my hand truly empty? Can you see my hand empty? I hope you know where the ball is. Can you see where the ball is? That ball, in just a second, is supposed to become invisible. When I take that finger and squash this stuff, the ball is supposed to become invisible. Watch. Right Floats down to the box, and we have a rule with magic. Don't do the same trick twice for the same people. If you do, they may catch on to what's going on. Can you see the ball? Did you see it when there? This time you know what's going to happen. Watch. An empty hand. Do you see where the ball's going, young fella? Going right in the hand there? There's the ball. That one finger right there is supposed to make it become invisible. When I squeeze the knuckle like that, say go. When you say go, go. Float right through the air. That's the end of the air. That's <laughs> the camera and um, I thought that tonight uh, this is the end of the performance for tonight I thought that tonight it might be um, interesting 20 years from now if we scan the camera around and maybe have everyone introduce themselves um, can you do that Joe can you move that around you have that, that flexibility sure what you might do is we might shut off the camera bring it down this way and turn it towards the audience that might make it a lot Whatever you want to do. Okay, well, can you, do you, can you get people that close to you if you turn around and back over? Yeah. They can. Okay, well, why don't we start over here then? Um, if you just stand up. Anthony Murphy, President of Assembly 104. Stand up. That's all right. That's all right. Keep it moving. Dave Brisboy, Vice President, Assembly Number 9, Boston, Mass. Joel Haas, assistant to David Brisbane in the Full Link Show. Jerry Fields, assistant to Ann Fields over there. Leo <laughs> Orsi, uh, treasurer of 122. Hi. <laughs> 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 
time to Chrissy. Twenty years ago, uh, we did this. I may be dead right now. <laughs> I just want you to know, I was the best. <laughs> That's why I'm not here. Thank you. Jack Bryan, President Number Nine, Boston. Dave Chrissy is dead. <laughs> John Perfeo. Richard Sim, Secretary Treasurer of Rhode Island Societies of Magicians. George McElhenney, member of number nine. Friend of Betsy Ross. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, I'm Bob Brand. I'm president of the SAM, uh, number 26 of Providence. Alan Wasselot, cartoonist, also known as Alan the Uncanny. Ed Carey. Harry Carey. Mike Malloy. Bob Massey. Joe Burke, Vice President, Assembly 26 in Providence. Al Massey, Vice President, 122. Gordon Barry, President of Assembly Number 16 in Worcester. I want to be a magician when I grow up. <laughs> <laughs> How about a big hand for everybody? Well, we have also the cameraman, and I think Bill Town is right there, right away. Yeah, why don't I get, why don't I pull those people in? Is it on? Yes. <laughs> Dave Downs, President of Ring 122. Next is Ray Galay. Hi. <laughs> I'm Ray Goulet. Now, I may look like the guy that's dead right now, but this is also 20 years later, and I want you to know I have the finest magic shop in the world. Thank you. We also have Joe. You want to run out front? Go ahead, Joe. Yeah, Show your head. Come on, Joe. Come on, Joe. Come on, Joe. Don't want to break the camera. Yeah, Come on, Joe. Is it on? Yes, yeah, sir. Hi, I'm Joseph Beduto. I'm the second vice president of Ring 122 of Boston. Okay, great. Okay, well, that's it for tonight. Um, so you're welcome to have refreshments. We'll see you next. Uh, hope I'll hope all Let's get ready. Oh, yeah, he won't. I don't think he wants to. I don't want to force him. Oh, we should. Let's, let's do it the easy way. We want, we want Ray. 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 And Doug, come on in. 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 Come on well, we'll call this the end of the night then, on November 26, 1985. Bye-bye.